a, it's a real pleasure to have our speakers, our guests, and our fellows here this afternoon um, or evening, depending on where we are. Um, just a quick one about Be Fantastic. Kamya and I started this festival three years ago now um, with the idea of bringing technology and arts practice to public space and to, to the public to kind of um, create more of a conversation around uh, the UN SDGs. Um, we've learned a lot in the last three years. The world has changed tremendously, um, but we still have um, steady and uh, kind of steady focus on our, on our tagline, radical, open, optimistic future. Um, we still believe that that is possible and that the way towards that is with amazing people, um, especially those in the arts, in the policy, in the technology spaces to take leadership and move the world to a place where we all want to go. Um, with that, I'd love to introduce our uh, three uh, special guests. Uh, Jaina Kotari is a uh, senior advocate and the founder of the Center for Law and Policy Research. She's a brilliant, brilliant um, mind and has been advocating along with her organization for um, uh, transgender and internet access rights. Very successfully, I might add, very successfully. We hope to hear about those things shortly. Um, Jackie, is, um, Jackie is the CEO and artistic director of the National Theatre of Scotland. No small task given the times. Um, and she does it incredibly gracefully. Um, um, I'm really happy to say that, um, you know, um, we're always particularly delighted to have powerful, strong women um, and showcase them. So here are two fabulous examples. And of course, there's uh, the wonderful Mr. Sean Blagsworth. Um, he's been an advisor to, to our journey at uh, Bengaluru Fantastic. He is the architect of Dara.network and um, he works at Marco Polo, has had a long history with policy and technology, worked with the White House um, on the advisory panel or on the advisory committee for uh, internet technology policy. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand off to uh, Sean. Thank you, Archana, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to have Jaina and Jackie here today and to talk about kind of this union of how does tech policy, and data privacy, and surveillance and come together really with the arts? And more generally, how can the arts and really public advocacy come together? And, and so this is really a conversation between two folks that had different fields and went to different types of colleges, but you know, with our thesis that when, when different fields come together, we can really move things in interesting ways. And so we'll have a conversation about you know, the ways that the arts can be effective in addressing themes and these political themes. Uh, we'll dig into why does you know, data privacy and surveillance matter. We'll look at some of the examples where you know, Jackie has been using a technology uh, you know, in interesting ways to push the public agenda in Scotland. And Jaina can talk about some of the casework that she's seen here around these really fundamental rights. Um, and then we'll also then talk about, you know, ways that, you know, these fields can come together effectively to move public opinion and public awareness. And then how do we do that better in the context of the whole world moving more and more, and more online, especially with social distancing and especially with COVID, where so many of the ways that we used to engage the public as, as artists are, are now have to go into this kind of, you know, online only sense. And so with that, uh, I would like to basically uh, introduce uh, Jaina to basically give us a sense of, you know, why do these issues of essentially data privacy and surveillance matter? And, and a little bit of the context of how those things are getting played out uh, in the Indian context. So over to Jaina. Thanks, thanks, Sean. And thanks, uh, Archana and Kamya uh, for inviting me to this panel. I'm excited uh, and excited uh, to listen to uh, uh, Jackie and some of the questions as well. So yeah, so let me start off on what I thought uh, would be a good uh, overview of how we look at data privacy in India um, and, um, and then get into some of these uh, difficult issues. So one of the things is that in India, we don't have any data privacy law uh, the way the UK and many other countries do have. Um, so we don't have it. And so then how is um, data privacy understood? And 
in India, the big kind of uh, uh, change came in 2017. And in 2017, uh, it was for the first time that, you know, we had this really uh, big landmark judgment of the Supreme Court, uh, which held that there is a fundamental right to privacy. I mean, this wasn't clear until 2017. And this came in the context of the Aadhaar judgment. Um, I don't know how many are aware of it. There was this huge litigation uh, on uh, the national, uh, like a national identity card project called the Aadhaar. And uh, this had serious uh, data privacy issues because it used biometrics and other uh, personal information of all applicants. And in that context, the Supreme Court examined whether there is a constitutional right to privacy that we all have. And it recognized a fundamental right to privacy. And so what does this right to privacy mean? Um, and the court said that there are three aspects of our privacy. There is a right to physical privacy in the sense that we can control any bodily uh, interference. Uh, there is a privacy of choice, which means that we have the right to decide our most intimate decisions without interference from the state. And the third is informational or data privacy, which is we can regulate, or I mean, you know, we should have full control over our own data and uh, personal information. And so how does this kind of data privacy or informational privacy play out? Um, you know, so, so yes, so there was this big judgment uh, and it, but it, it wasn't followed by any legislation. So, you know, we, we have in principle in India, all of us have the right to information or data privacy for our very personal information and how it can be used or controlled. But um, as we all know, um, you know, regulating information privacy, especially in, you know, the time of, you know, social media, online, you know, we, we're constantly online. It's extremely hard to regulate. And we kind of see that um, there is use of our data co continuously being used without our permission uh, or even our knowledge. Uh, there is profiling done, you know, based on our online lives. Uh, you know, there are constant background checks done on all of us. So, so then how do we kind of control our data? And, and uh, to control, I mean, you know, I would say that uh, if we want to retain our own pri the privacy to our data, there's essentially three kinds of uh, ways and three ways in which we do it. One is um, secrecy, that we kind of don't reveal information that we don't want to reveal about us. Uh, there's control. So we control, you know, how our information is used. And the third is anonymity, that we should have the right to be anonymous where we want to. And so all of this raises very, very difficult and complex questions of policy and implementation. I mean, you know, it's it's great on theory, but how does it play out in the real real world? And you know, just to give a couple of examples, if I if I have a few minutes. Um, so in this time of COVID, uh, you know, what what has been happening? I mean, COVID has thrown up bigger cha big challenges on data or data and information privacy. And just one example: what has been happening? Uh, in many cities across India is that the municipal corporations, the minute, you know, this happened in the early time of the lockdown, the, you know, because there was so much emphasis on, uh, on uh, quarantining and uh, contact tracing that the minute people were known to be COVID positive in Bangalore, for example, their houses would be, uh, you know, cordoned off. There would be BBMP posters put up with the names and details of who is tested positive. You know, um, and uh, while this was certainly a big uh, privacy uh, violation, what was happening with marginalized communities like the trans community um, is that a lot of transgender people were outed um, uh, where they hadn't come out to uh, close family members because uh, and this was all done uh, in the context of COVID, public health, surveillance. So, you know, a lot of these boundaries were continuously breached. Uh, so that's about, uh, you know, how do we uh, kind of retain control of our data where we don't want it, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, we don't want some of this data going out. Another interesting case is the case of anonymity, you know, where we want to retain anonymity. And I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, talk about a very, very interesting case that I was a part of. And 
uh, this was uh, before the Delhi High Court and this was concerning uh, a very well-known artist, Subodh Gupta, who was accused of sexual harassment. Uh, there was an Instagram account um, started, an art, uh, you know, by, uh, called uh, Seen and Heard. I mean, this is public. The, who owned the account was anonymous and the people who, the person or persons who had started this account used it to speak about um, artists who uh, who had been found to be sexually harassing uh, women and uh, complainants had anonymously kind of given information to this uh, Instagram account and um, Subodh Gupta went to the High Court and asked for the uh, names of the Instagram account and the uh, people who had posted to be made public. Uh, and the issue was that, do they have a right to remain anonymous? Uh, the court wasn't particularly uh, in favor of anonymity and ultimately the matter was settled and the case was closed by, by way of an out of court settlement. But I think this raises many of these issues that we need to discuss. Uh, um, how do we regulate and uh, you know data privacy? How do we re how do we retain control of it in our day to day lives? Um, how do courts uh, you know deal with it when they are faced with these kind of problems? How do governments deal with it? Can you say that privacy or uh, be uh, you know uh, taken away where there are larger issues of say public health uh, or you know so yeah there are you know there there are going to be many kind of balancing issues and um, yeah so uh, lots to think about. Thank you, Jaina. Uh, we'll get back to some of those. They're very interesting and you know some of the issues you brought up to be frank, are, are relevant to the work that Arch and I are doing around DARA uh, as well. So we'll, we'll get to that at the end. Um, so at this point, Jackie, I'd love to sort of turn the podium uh, over to you and to get us a sense of like what's going on in the UK, what is the relationship of Scotland to the UK and the role of the National Theatre Company within all of that. Great. I have to say that um, just listening to you there, it's very rare that you're on a panel where you find the content to be so useful because um, actually there's something so interesting about the way the theater specifically has rushed so kind of like wholeheartedly towards digital and online. Um, and actually you're provoking me to think about the conversations that have been lost in the in this, with the speed by which we have all shifted our operating models away from the live experience to the online experience. And maybe we could pick up a bit on that because you're making me think about our responsibility to artists and to audiences um, in, in this kind of, um, you know, this kind of, I don't want to use the word panic, but at the beginning of the lockdown, we all just kind of ran towards moving to online. And I think that's really interesting what you say about, about the almost like a war, some warnings there. Um, but um, just, to, just to say a little bit about National Theatre of Scotland, um, we um, were the first ever national theatre in the world to be set up to not have our own building. Um, what, what that means is that um, when we were set up, we, it was uh, it, the strategy for the formation of the National Theatre of Scotland, which was only 15 years ago, was that rather than having a big monolithic building that would take resource, it, like the formation of a, of a big building would take resource from the rest of the cultural infrastructure in Scotland, a much more innovative and interesting model would be to have the confidence to set up a national theatre that, that existed wherever, um, wherever we chose to make theatre. So we, we, we make work in tiny town halls, we make work on ferries, we, we make work for the biggest theatres all over the country, but we are equally proud to co-create with communities to to make work wherever we feel that there's an important story to be told. Um, and what that 
I suppose means for this conversation is that um, we have entirely shifted our without walls to being um, digital and online. So when the um, COVID crisis happened at, in March of this year in the UK, um, we had to cancel our entire programme of work and we had to immediately explore. Um, the, the fascinating thing for us was that because we don't have our own theatre building, actually the cancelling of our work allowed us to, like we, we didn't, we're, we're less reliant on the ticket sales of the theatre shows because we don't have a building. So actually the job of work that we had to do was how do we communicate with our audiences and how do we um, how do we continue to employ artists in the context of all of the theatre buildings being closed and it is I will tell you an enormous uh, responsibility and um, there is a there is a sense of um, of being kind of designated survivor or last woman standing or something at, at the moment. Um, so that said, we've been working like with a very optimistic embrace of the possibility of um, online digital, um, the, the fact that we can keep going. And one example that we're so proud of is that we had planned an event um, called the Coming Back Out Ball, which was about um, the LGBTQI plus community in Scotland um, who were over 70 having this, um, having an event where they would be able to express themselves and come together for a huge celebration um, in recognition that for older senior people from that community, often the older that they, the older they became, the less visible they were. And of course, because of the COVID crisis, the older you are, the more vulnerable you are to, um, yeah, the more physically vulnerable you are in a health, from a health perspective. But of course, we wanted to continue this political action, which was to celebrate um, the LGBT community of, of older people in Scotland. So we immediately moved that event um, that event online um, and continue to have these social dance clubs, which actually were able to move from being a very Scottish focused thing to an international community um, all across the world of these of older people um, being able to come together. And what was so fascinating about that process was that it enabled us I don't, I'm sure it's the same in India, but the, one of the biggest conversations has been about care homes, um, about the, the treatment of people in care homes and in hospitals. Um, and actually, there, there is something in Scotland about um, the way that older people are treated within the care system and how we value that. So we were able to bring in politicians into that dialogue about the treatment of older people within a wider society in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't shifted our work to digital um, and online. And um, similarly, um, like everybody across the world at the moment, Scotland is asking itself very difficult questions about race, about systemic racism, um, not just because of Black Lives Matter, but because it's it's a conversation that as a national theatre, we have to, we hold very carefully in everything that we do. Um, so we've moved, we are developing a, a work called Ghosts, which uses um, mobile phone technology to uh, create an augmented reality experience throughout Glasgow, which paints a picture of Glasgow and its um, terrible relationship to uh, slavery and the slave trade. And using that mobile phone platform um, to, to create this kind of interactive, immersive, augmented experience so that you, Scotland, like all nations um, who were a part of colonialism has tries to deny its its history and its um a, a, and its troubled past and this is a way of us kind of um 
exposing and having a dialogue about that, which is only made possible by technology and, and it will audiences will be able to do that because they're not going to be in theatres and they're not, you know, we can that we can do that at, at social distance. So that's just a, a couple um, a couple of examples. No, that's fascinating, Jackie. We'll stop uh, there. Uh, yeah. Sorry, did you have a question, China? No, I was just saying it's, um, yeah. I, could, I could keep going, but yeah. I'll just pause because I think it's better to have no. a dialogue, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the question that I find so interesting about both of your work is to sort of hop onto this theme of like, how is it that is that is people that are trying to engage in, in civic society and dialogue and policy change, uh, how did your two different fields come together? And so I'm kind of curious to hear from both of you to say, you know, Jaina, as you're thinking about work that is trying to extend human rights and better rights for marginalized communities, what are the collaborations with artists that have been really effective? And then Jackie, from your perspective as well, and like, I'm just kind of curious, like, what are the ways that we can kind of lean into each other to amplify, you know, our respective agendas? And, and more examples is probably the way to answer that question. Um, I mean, I would just say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, what Jackie spoke about was really exciting and uh, something that we would like to push, uh, you know, at CLPR, our work is in the field of, um, you know, transgender rights, disability, caste, discrimination, and it's really about equality and discrimination. Uh, that's the larger uh, theme and, uh, you know, while, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has kind of raised the issue of systemic uh, discrimination, that is something that has been raised in India in the context of caste in a very, very big way, historically. Uh, so, uh, and so systemic discrimination uh, on the basis of caste uh, against women, gender-based discrimination is a huge issue that I think is not just, you know, we can't address it just uh, by the law. You know, we have to address it in so many different ways. And I think uh, pushing these, these difficult uh, themes using the arts and using all other media, I think, uh, you know, and if the arts can kind of use uh, the arts and the, so uh, the arts, social movements, can um, use the law as an important part of their, uh, you know, larger strategy. And I think all of us would benefit because I, I'm sure that not, you know, it's uh, the social movements would need everything, would need the uh, policymakers, would need the law, would need the activists, would need the artists. And we're all activists in some, you know, in one part of our, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, lives and so kind of how to channel all of that. Jackie, I would love you to hear your take on that too. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, the relationship to activism and policy change is a really complex one for the National Theatre of Scotland because we are funded by the government. So we can never align ourselves either positively, like, for us to take a position, a political position, is really an impossible thing to do because the National Theatre of Scotland has got to have a life that is beyond any one governmental administration. So, and, and the other thing is that we, um, we have this um, kind of mission that we're extremely proud of, which is to be a theatre for everyone. So we, we actually can't take a position, even if as individuals we feel strongly, it, for us to take a position aligns us with one part of the nation, even if that is what we feel is the right position. Um, it actually, to be for everybody, you can't take a political position. And I'll give you an interesting, but, but what I was gonna say is we can enable, we can enable artists to have a conversation on our behalf. So for example, when the Brexit vote was happening, we couldn't take a position on Brexit because although Scotland voted to stay within the European Union, 
it was only by a small majority. So there was a large part of the population um, who did vote for Brexit. So we like we could, we would alienate ourselves from half of the population. So it would be an, it's an inappropriate use of it's an inappropriate um, version of our mission to be a theatre for everyone. But we we could commission artists to respond to the concepts of U Europeanness. Um, which is a different, which is a different interpretation. And the other thing about being a national theatre and, and activism and policy is um, just an example is we did this uh, production called Adam, which um, came about because one of our associate directors met a young um, Egyptian trans man who had moved from, he moved from Egypt in order um, to, 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 to find his identity as a man in Scotland because of the difference between those, um, those countries. And um, there is a line in the play where, just to try and bring us back to technology as well, there is a line in the play where Adam, when he is um, in Egypt, opens up his laptop. Um, and this is while he's like figuring out what yeah who he is and he puts into his laptop can the soul of a man be trapped in the body of a woman which is an incredibly poetic interpretation of the trans experience but in the moment in the play when he puts that into his computer suddenly like he is he is met with his community which exists globally um that he would never have had access to if it hadn't been for this like moment of technology so in the process of making that play, we we um, reached out to trans communities all over the world. And at the end of the play, which even when I talk about it, I start to feel really emotional. At the end of the play, uh, a, a global choir of trans individuals sing sings in the most exquisite song about this: "Can the soul of a man be trapped in the body of a woman?" And you see, in a huge a huge theatre set. You just see all of these individual kind of screens of um, these these tra these trans individuals singing the song as a kind of unified global choir, which would only be possible through the use of technology. And and the other the other thing um, about that is that that we we made that show in 20, 2017, which. I think we've, because of COVID, we've all lost the concept of time. But um, actually, it was before this dialogue in Scotland about the trans experience. Um, and actually, I do, I do think that Adam, in a way, stimulated a kind of nationwide understanding about trans. And, and for me, it was a personal journey because I don't think I understood the trans experience until I like went through the journey of producing that show. So. So I guess I'm saying like there is a there is a such an important function in culture and creating empathy and understanding and um, glo global communities of empathy and understanding. Thank you, Jackie. That's amazing. Um, it gets to the next question I'm going to ask actually for both of you. Um, but I'm going to make one small little point of order, which is for anybody that's listening out there, if you've got questions, please just add them into the Q&A tab. And then we'll get to that in about 10 minutes uh, as we sort of get to other questions. But going back to one of the things you said is, uh, you know, one of the themes that Be Fantastic has is, you know, what does a, a radical, open, optimistic future with technology look like? And usually when we think about the role of data privacy and surveillance, we tend to focus on the negative. We tend to focus on these dystopian visions of 1984 and Westworld and Terminator. And there's so many examples in art and culture where we have spelled a really dire picture of what the future may hold. And so I was curious from your perspective, right, from both of you, if you were to look out, say, not even too far, let's say 15 years, in terms of where do you expect to see the, the nature of, of digital art and our engagement here and how those engage with political themes? Like, uh, I'd be very curious like, if you were to look into your ball and what do you see coming forward? And, and I guess the, this, the one piece of story that I found really heartening there is like, clearly this connection for marginalized communities, they've been able to find each other. 
right? And in that finding, there's been an incredible amount of support and, th and that's a good thing, right? And so I suppose I'm looking for, you know, what, what are the other examples of that that you guys see coming? Let's start with Jaina and then we can go back to Jackie. Okay, um, I, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, like from the last couple of years, even perhaps before this, uh, the COVID kind of pandemic, which has kind of, you know, made us all, you know, completely digital in so many ways. But I think there's been a lot of uh, kind of uh, positive um, use of the digital that we've seen. And I find that uh, the most innovative ways um, has been through, uh, you know, um, through the fight for legal rights. And one of the examples, um, you know, I want to talk about my case uh, um, on uh, internet access in Assam that uh, right. uh, that I had fought, and that was a case. And you know, we're all, I think, uh, seeing times where in the few in the in the, in the last few years, uh, we're seeing uh, authoritarian governments um, in so many different. Um, you know, uh, forms. And in India, this has been going on for the last several, last four or five years. Um, and last year, there were, I think India faced the largest number of internet shutdowns uh, anywhere in the world. And internet shutdowns were being used as a form to uh, quell protests, um, civil protests on uh, government policies, whether it was the CAA, uh, or, you know, other legislation. And um, so one incident was in Assam, this was a state in the Northeast, and uh, there was an internet ban, uh, which went on for about 10 days. And this uh, ban was challenged in the High Court. And what was interesting is that this was challenged by a trans person. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't think that, right? You would think that uh, it would be other civil rights activists, prominent people uh, challenging it, but it, but that wasn't the case. Uh, it was a trans activist who challenged the internet uh, ban on the ground that uh, this takes away, um, you know, the trans community's uh, forms of livelihood and access to all means of, of you know, whether it's livelihood, education, um, access to health, uh, health care, which, uh, I mean, of course, it, 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 the internet became a right a way of, uh, you know, uh, access to all these things for everyone. But I think uh, the trans community or the most marginalized communities feel it the most, because in many ways, um, online spaces are where, uh, you know, you know, now, I mean, I, I think for uh, more vulnerable communities, it's the only spaces which are more accessible in many ways. And so we uh, so uh, we fought that case and uh, the uh, High Court um, kind of set, you know, quashed the ban and said that the internet has to be resumed immediately. And uh, by that evening of, you know, when the arguments were done and the decision was made, and this was after 10 days of uh, an internet ban in the state. And uh, so, you know, I think that's really, uh, it's a different way of looking at activism, looking at uh, digital rights, um, looking at internet rights, uh, how do we, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, how do communities uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, work with the state or use, uh, you know, what forms of activism is used and so, you know, while we move from there to the COVID time, I mean, we, we're seeing that digital spaces um, have opened up tremendously. You know, I mean, we've had um, online consultations on um, new legislations and, you know, they've been to some extent far more vibrant than physical uh, consultations because this means that people sitting anywhere in the country uh, are able to access some of these conversations and contribute to some of these conversations so um so i think uh, the future is very very optimistic um and uh, it's just opening opening up more and more spaces for um these kind of interactions now jackie earlier you had said something that 
caught my ear, which is that you said that you know the shift of digital had revived your faith in the potential for the arts. Um, and I would love for you to elaborate on that as again as you look forward to the future and you know look into your own magic ball, what's coming. Yeah, I guess um so inspiring to hear you talk there um about legislative change, which we all know is like the sort of end game of artistic um agitation. Um for me, I think there's something about the next generations that that the, there's there's some intersecting strands of thought for me at the moment around um the way that young people have been treated appallingly um certainly um in the uk young people have been for the last few years they have been um you know, they, they are the ones that will be kind of living with the decisions that we're making at the moment, like the next generation um, are, are the people who um, will inherit the decisions that we're making now and will inherit the impact, ec the economic impact of COVID. And yet they're also simultaneously being blamed for spreading the virus. So there's something for me about the fact that the next generation are the ones that are, um, leading and shaping the technology and and um if i was to look for optimism I, I would hope that they would also be empowered to change and to shape a better future and you know in scotland we are proud that we we are trying to define ourselves as having a different set of national cultural values to the other parts of the uk if i can say that carefully like um Scotland like our identity at the moment we are we are seeking to define ourselves as through words like tolerance and optimism and equity um and and doing that in contrast to other um political positions um so for me um there is an optimism in the possibility of the next generations using technology to gather and form communities to make sure that our national cultural values continue to be about social change and um, improving the world for everyone. And I think with every kind of, with I think about the climate emergency because, um, you know, in, 2008, we were in a climate emergency and then the banking crisis happened, didn't it? And then everything, there's constantly, um, there are constant moments that are happening that are eclipsing our prioritization of the climate emergency. So there's something for me about technology and the next generations and, and the climate emergency, which I don't have the answers for, but I feel like those are the things that we should be thinking about. Now, again, uh, this is a question for some of the younger folks in the audience and people that are just sort of beginning their careers in this space. I'm curious, uh, you know, especially for you, Gina, for somebody that's getting into these things, like I feel like you've been a, a really amazing advocate in this space and have, and have achieved some real victories. And I'm curious, you know, what advice you would have for people that want to basically make change? Um, and, you know, if you're entering this space as a young prospective lawyer, and I'll ask you the same question, Jackie, when it comes up. Uh, you know, what advice would you be giving them in terms of preparing to change the world? Sorry, I, I just lost you guys for a moment. Uh, Sean, if you- uh, No, no problem. Uh, my question was just what advice would you give to a young person who's like, you know, going into preparing to be a lawyer or, you know, just starting their career now as they, you know, try to basically prepare themselves to make meaningful change. Um, I would be curious for your answer on that. Okay, I mean, it's an exciting time, I think, uh, for um, young people to start off their careers as lawyers. And I would, I mean, I would just say that looking at, uh, you know, digital technology, uh, new issues arising, um, new legal issues arising, uh, because of uh, uh, the digital world. I mean, it's just quite an exciting time. So 
uh, kind of just yeah uh, embrace all of this and uh, be open to some of these issues and um, how do you I mean, focus on how the law can bring about social change I mean that's that's that was one of my motivations in practicing law that how I can use the law to bring about social change and I I don't think that has changed my message still remains the same but I think there are uh, more exciting ways for social change now than they were probably 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and Jaina, what would you, or sorry, Jackie, what would you act, add to that? Especially if for folks that are looking at a career in the arts. Yeah, I mean, um, the sort of paradox that we're living in is that the arts are in a huge crisis, but we are feeling the value of the arts and the social purpose of the arts more intensely than any of us have ever felt them. Um, I'm just thinking of this example of this um, at the beginning of lockdown, we started a project called Scenes for Survival, which were these digital artworks. Um, they were short, we made 50 of them and they were five minute pieces. And um, we used a lot of um, kind of big name Scottish celebrities in them. And we also did a lot of open calls and one of the pieces, so the top one has been seen by, I don't know, it's about 4 million people. And then the second one, second most viewed one, has been seen by 2 million people. And it's called The Domestic. And a domestic in Scotland is the cleaning staff within hospitals. So the people that you, even if you go into hospital, you would probably wouldn't really see them in Scotland. Um, and they support the nurses. and. The piece that we that we made was written by a playwright who was also a nurse on the COVID wards. And the piece is about the comfort that the domestics or so the cleaners in the Scottish hospitals, they know the names of all the patients. Um, and it's this uh, person who has been admitted to the COVID ward and um, uh, not because of COVID, but because of a suicide attempt. And she is comforted by the domestic and the whole piece is about... Um, the fact that basically this key worker, this really not well paid person within Scottish society, in a way saves the life of this young woman who's on the COVID ward and how that is an unseen kind of function. And actually it's, it's so intensely emotional, the fact that that piece has been seen by two, mil, two million people um, by a playwright who is still kind of emerged, she's, she works really hard as a nurse and she's a playwright. Um, and the actor in that piece is an actor that we find through an open call, you know, just a, a, a emerging actor. Um, and for me, like it sums up why we do what we do because that piece has been seen by so many people because theater as an art form can actually take people through a crisis as it's happening. So it was actually able to comfort people like I think when when we write um funding applications we write things like the value of the arts and the arts can provide solace and arts can fight, provide comfort but I just there's just something about where this exact moment that we're in now where the work that we're doing culturally has is actually taking people through a crisis and that's that's so important at the same time that the industry is in a complete crisis, which is a paradox, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it brings up this other question I was going to ask you too, which is, you know, tremendously important, especially, again, if you're taking on the perspective of people that want to be practitioners here, which is, uh, you know, how do people make money, right, that are caring about these issues? How do they support themselves? How do you get enough to eat? Uh, how do you turn it into a movement? Um, and I'd be really curious to, from you both, of like, you know, what are the funding and kind of revenue strategies that, you know, you and your organizations have employed? What have you seen as effective as we're trying to bring awareness, like through art, through social change? Uh, would Jackie like to go first? Yeah, um, I think that's a really interesting issue. Uh, oh, there's so many strands to it. One is the issue with like, we're all offering a lot of free content at the moment and it's not sustainable. So like our scenes for survival program, it employed 300 people, but we gave the content away free. And that which, which, which is the right thing to do for audiences. And we're able to do it because we're 
well funded, relatively well funded by the Scottish government, so we can do that. Um, but I think there is an, there are issues around the sustainability of our. Sorry, my that's my other computer. Um, the sustainability of artists' um, careers, if if they're expected to put content out for free, and I, the the other thing that's happening in the UK is. This, a lot of like the cork has come off a lot of conversations about the disparity between the leadership of institutions and those people on salaries within institutions and those people that are closest to the making of the art, which is the artists and the freelance, the freelance workers. And the, actually this thing that we've tried to kind of paper over the cracks of, which is the the inequality, which is that artists are living in a kind of precarious economic situation and institutions are safe and well funded, um, even though the artists are doing the, the labour, um, there's a real intense dialogue about that at the moment. Yeah, but I, I'm very curious, just we'll do the art piece and then I want to do the kind of legal side too of like, you know, if you're if you're starting out now, or you know, you're a few years into this career, what advice would you give to somebody to basically, you know, make sure that that they have enough to to you know, be able to continue to do what they do and, you know, not leave the field? Um, like, you know, how do people make it? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's just like well, that's an impossible question to answer. Um, like, all I can say is that that. You need to fight for like you need to unionize and fight for your rights whilst also like I think for a long time people have been the the conversation that the pandemic has opened up is the fact that the act of making art is labor so it's not you're not driven by passion you're not driven by love it's like what you're doing is work it's an industry that um it's an industry that brings economic return. It brings like um, it 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 brings tourism. It brings you know that the, you're not doing it for by choice. You're doing it because you're part of the global economy of labor, um, and that's a much more effective argument than an argument around like the value of what you're doing. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. And just to kind of. Uh, you know, take that same argument to work and labor. Um, you know, I mean, I, I I'll get to how it kind of in the in this COVID time what's happening. But you know, even slightly before this, you know, with the whole Me Too movement um, in India, uh, and when we saw this, uh, you know, there, there's been this huge uh, kind of outpouring of um, um, harass, you know, uh, harassment faced by young women artists and workers. Um, and that, in fact, kind of catalyzed uh, a lot of uh, uh, activists to, to categorize artists as workers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, for example, you know, this has led to uh, a, mo a movement where uh, artists have come together to form, you know, there, there are no unions and there's no unionizing in the art world because uh, you know, in the art world in India, everything is unorganized. So art workers, young artists, I mean, there is no uh, organized, there, there isn't an organized sector. And this kind of led to um, kind of framing them as culture workers. So that's the kind of language used in the Indian context as workers, you know, uh, but uh, culture workers. And now we are seeing that, in, you know, during the COVID time, you know, some of the issues you raised, Jackie, that um, you know, access to funds, uh, uh, you know, you, you may have larger institutions getting the money, but the real uh, artists, craftspersons at the, uh, you know, uh, grassroots level have no income. And, you know, we're seeing uh, situations where, for example, the government of India has given uh, grants to large institutions like the Lalit Kala Academy, but they've not distributed the money to the uh, smaller artists. And that's where the culture workers kind of groups are kind of getting together to get the uh, money released, to get uh, access uh, in a framework that is, we are workers and recognize 
uh, our rights as workers and our rights to livelihood. Awesome. That's, that's exactly right. It's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so at this point, we're going to bring on as panelists as well some of our fellows that have been part of the collab program for with Be Fantastic last week. And so, Navia, if you want to invite them into the Zoom, uh, we'll get to see their faces and hear from them directly. Um, and so while that's happening, so I've got a question that came in online. Um, and then... So this is, I think, an interesting one, and it's very, it's a bit technical, but I think it's relevant, which is how will the recent trend toward backdoor access to end-to-end -end encryption programs impact digital activism and free speech? And so just to put this in more layman's terms, you know, if you use WhatsApp today, it says this conversation is end-to-end is -end encrypted. And what we have seen uh, in the last several months is doesn't matter if it's encrypted, the government could still get it. They, they got the, you know, 1200 um, cultural activists from all over the world. The point is it was hacked. Um, and so, and, and the more and more globally, you see uh, surveillance organization that's asking for ways to basically get into the private communications that people have all over. And so I'm curious, you know, from one, for both of you of like, is this an issue? Is this a problem? Uh, and then two, uh, is there anything we can do about it? Uh, so maybe Jaina, why don't you take this one and then we'll get to the questions from the fellows. I mean, this is a huge issue in India um, and primarily because digital uh, activism has been seen as a form of activism where, which, uh, which seemed to be much more easier for people and kind of more democratic for people to uh, use as a medium for protests, for their activism. But we're seeing, um, and you know, for guarantee of their rights to free speech, but we are seeing that, uh, you know, uh, in the Indian context, we're seeing this being, uh, you know, eroded quite systematically. Uh, if you, you know, WhatsApp conversations, messages are tapped, um, governments are using it, you know, Facebook um, and social media activism is, uh, you know, um, uh, activists are being imprisoned by social media or Facebook comments, even likes or sharing a post, um, you know. Um, so then, um, and that is interpreted as activism, it's interpreted as sedition, it's interpreted as, uh, you know, activities against uh, national security, um, you know, so, uh, so, you know, so, of course, so this, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, so how do we kind of respond to that? And uh, that is a very serious issue. A lot of young people and young activists are look, looking, looking at the digital space uh, for activism, activism uh, through their writing, activism through their art, all done online. And uh, we have to really find, push the borders to see that it's protected. Um, you know, there would be uh, it, there would be opinions which are not common or not popular, but we have to fight to say that uh, you can't shut down my uh, free speech. And you know, and and that fight is getting quite difficult in India today. Absolutely. Um, so I'd love to take a question from one of our fellows. Uh, can you guys just raise your hand, and then I'll pick whoever's got a hand up that uh, wants to go first. You just raise your physical hand. Uh, I can see all of you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Why don't you take a shot? And oh, please introduce the little fellow that's next to you. I actually put it in the chat because I don't know how loudly he might shriek. <laughs> so uh, it was just actually meant for all three of you, in fact, including Sean, that, uh, you know, many of the platforms that we use as young creators, particularly digital or online, have now been sort of taken over or are in the process of being absorbed by larger corporates, uh, which also means there are backdoors. Uh, so we just, I just wanted to understand, you know, how can we make these spaces our own, uh, you know, through our art, through our subversion and kind of not worry so much about the looming shadow of, of you know, whatever else is happening. Uh, and uh, Sean, please don't say Dada necklace because we're already there. So. 
Sure, I'll defer to, I would love to your perspective on this as well, Jackie, in terms of you know, how, how, like do people feel like they have these safe spaces in, in the UK and the EU and, and how are the people reacting to it? I honestly think that there is a risk that we're all, that we feel so, that there's so many geopolitical things going on that feel more obvious that it isn't a dialogue that we're effectively having with ourselves. Um, and I think maybe in the UK, there's been so many seismic political shifts. So in the UK, because we're, you know, we're facing Brexit, we're facing the breakup of the UK. Um, like, I, I don't think we're having enough of a conversation about these issues because we're so concerned with, um, like the impact of austerity and um, these kind of bigger, bigger, the things that are actually um, not more important necessarily, but, but are closer to our faces, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, it's funny. I think about this all the time of when I was in college, and this was a while ago, I wrote this paper looking at, you know, there, were, there was a really big important paper in the 80s called Bowling Alone. It was written by this guy, Robert Putnam, and he was looking at what was the effect on social capital from television. And his basic point is people don't go to bowling alleys in America anymore. So that's they're not friends with other people from the other side of the political perspective, whereas they used to maybe like be at the bowling alley and hang out with them. And then they could see that somebody who thought differently or voted differently actually shared a set of interests. And so he was really worried that with the advent of television and the widespread usage of television in the 70s and 80s, that this political uh, capital and going across boundaries would decrease. And so, and it, like I wrote this paper, goodness, in 96, uh, and basically said, what would the internet do to all that? And basically I had this fear that people as, and basically people can find any perspective they want and narrow cast on that such that the whole world of information looks like whatever perspective they already have. And I think that's to, to your point, Jackie, that unfortunately this is becoming more and more true, right? That whatever perspective, regardless of how strange it may be, you can validate that with a world of thousands, if not millions of other people that will share that perspective and reamplify it. And then suddenly, I, I have this deep fear that we will no longer agree on reality. And, and you see this happening all the time where you know, at least in American politics where people don't agree on facts. And if you don't agree on facts, like you know, to, to go back a few years, if you believe that Saddam Hussein blew up 9-11, you, know, you ask both most Americans and say, Saddam, let's assume that Saddam Hussein definitely blew up the Twin Towers in 9-11. Is it worth invading the country? Basically 80% of America then would say, yeah, you should go blow up, you know, invade the country. The, and the problem was that fundamental fact that Saddam Hussein did not blow up the towers, that fact people didn't disagree on. And so this is a, this is a fear that I certainly have, which is with our ability to, to basically narrow cast and to only sort of focus on the information that we're getting, that this will drive us further apart. Um, I do worry about that. The flip side that I would say too is like we, we need a space to have private conversations among our friends without getting accused of sedition, um, and and this is a this is a one of the motivating reasons that Archon and I have been working on an initiative called Dar.network, which is basically trying to take many of the modalities of things like LinkedIn and Instagram and WhatsApp and put them into a, a space and a technology platform we control. Um, and as we go forward, we want to build on top of things like Signal, which is probably the most secure and most encrypted formation of that, so that so that at least the cultural practitioners can have conversations that are that are private and are not beholden to advertising platforms. Um, so I'll stop plugging. Um, <laughs> so anyways, thank you. I'm totally in, Sean. I'm in. Awesome. <laughs> Feels like maybe the most important thing to be working on right now, what you've just said, feels like like now that you've said it, it feels so incredibly important and what a simple but straightforward way, that thing you said about the fear that with television, people wouldn't be meeting in public space and they wouldn't be forced to debate. And now you can see that on Twitter, which is like, you just have to go on Twitter and you can have everything that you say, it's confirmation bias, you can have everything that, that you think agreed with so so fascinating so how do you where is the space for 
meeting meeting to to actually figure out a better future and where is the space for dissent? I mean, one of the things that gives me hope is to be frank, when, when there are charters like yours, where that says we need to make content for everyone and we're not gonna basically pander either on the left or the right to only our own audience. And that, you know, I do think that's a tremendously valuable role and something I frank, like, you know, like the UK has not always done everything right in its history, but like every other country, but, you know, its support for its culture, I think has been, it's you know, commendable and, you know, more so than India, for example, and certainly more so than the States. Um, so I think Cole had another question. Uh, can we hear from you? Hi. Uh, a lovely uh, talk that you guys gave. I am a, a new media artist and um, I also have uh, recently been entangled in a lot of uh, 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 things connected to a certain kind of uh, uh, politics that my parents were part of. And recently as uh, China was uh, talking about the arrest that had happened uh, uh, to a lot of activists, uh, my mother was also arrested in one of those uh, arrest uh, which was connected to the Elgar Parishad and the Bhima Koregaon case. So uh, I, I'm pretty like closely connected to the courtroom sessions that I've seen. And uh, I have almost attended many of her bail hearings. And I wanted to talk very specifically about the way these proceedings happen. And I really like Jaina's and Jackie's perspective as, an, as a foreigner on this. Uh, so, a, they, the, the only evidence that they claim to have right now is entirely digital. Okay, they are claiming that they have letters and documents which claim that my mother and the others who are accused, the activists are, you know, have content that is anti-national and they have letters stating that they are connected to a quote unquote extremist movement and uh, a Maoist movement. So in, in situations like these, when the when you even when you read the evidence you know and you see that the, the letters are completely fabricated there are even spelling errors in those documents that have been produced as evidence in courts how do you sort of process the situation where uh, like legal institutions have lost complete uh, reason to you know bring up evidence and and the way they claim uh, uh, the you know their side of the story, especially from the public prosecutor's side, there is complete lack of reason. So in such a situation, how do you hold on to faith in uh, our, our judiciary, and how do you carry on? You know. Can I respond? Sure. Yes, please. Um, hi, Coel. Uh, wow, I mean. Uh, we've been reading about uh, their trial from what we can from the media. And um, I think, you know, I mean, one of the issues uh, with digital evidence is that, um, you know, it's a it's uh, so easy to tamper and doctor with, right? Because it's all digital. And it's, it's that much easier to to uh, doctor it and tamper it. Um, and kind of create what you want, uh, which is what the government uh, uh, is, you know, kind of doing and, uh, you know, saying that there have been communications, so showing links to, you know, terrorist groups or extremist groups, it's that much easier to do it digitally, uh, uh, as compared to kind of uh, documents, you know, hard documents. But I think the other issue, so, so you know, in that sense, that's a problem. Uh, with digital or technology, uh, but but the other problem is, I think, in our legal system, is that our judges. I mean, our, our judges are not that well versed in uh, in um, technology and on uh, on digital issues at all. So, I mean, you know, to even to kind of say that, well, you've produced this evidence. How do we know it's authentic? And uh, how do we know whether it's tampered or not? And uh, how do we test it? And um, so, you know, all these things, uh, our judges are extremely, um, you know, most judges, I'm not painting all of them with the same brush, but most uh, judges, lower court, I mean, you know, forget about lower court or high court, even Supreme Court judges, 
um, not too many of them have any serious clue about um, all these issues and technology. So it's uh, so it's you know you have to basically ask some of these questions that if if did you, if you know technology is going to become so much a part of our um, our legal issues, uh, it's going to be used selectively. Digital technology can be used so selectively. Uh, to curb activists, to curb human rights defenders, uh, to, you know, for the government as a form of surveillance, then shouldn't we be really, really uh, vigilant? And how do courts do that? Um, and right now, you know, our, our judges have no training in this. So we're really at, uh, in, a, in a difficult space. And they don't even have, even the police, for instance, when they raided my parents' house, there were no cyber laws or rules that they followed to copy the hard disk sent. So they just lifted the entire cabinet of the CPU and they just took that away, yeah. you know. So there's a process of stealing and none of that was followed. And yeah. then they are, I mean, how do you not know that they've not planted anything onto our hard disk? So our police, our prosecution agencies, yeah. our courts uh, are totally, uh, you know, uh, clueless and um, so I mean you know so that's a real issue how do we and at the same time they are using the same I mean they're clueless about the technology but they are showing like 7,000 pages worth of charge sheets that are entirely just whatsapp conversations group chats that are put into the charge sheet which is ridiculous I mean I don't even understand uh, you know where to begin it, it's like uh, uh, really a drama, like an absurd drama, comedy of the absurd happening in the courtrooms. It and feels like it's it's good fodder for an art piece too. <laughs> I don't know whether to laugh or to cry yes. out yes. a point, you know. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I think we've got another question from Smruti. Is she still here? Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is for Jackie. Um, so do you see other national theaters going in the direction of not being constrained by being rooted in a building? Because, I mean, it seems so anti-establishment to even go in this direction. And I mean, on one hand, it's freeing, it's great for the funding because you're not trying to maintain a building and all that. So it's kind of appealing, but it's also really kind of hits at the core of what an establishment means. So uh, do you see other national theaters doing this? Um, I mean, the thing is for us, there's something about the history of Scotland, which is uh, like there is something about the theatre culture in Scotland, uh, which is about like a kind of egalitarianism, a spirit of um, anti-establishment. As you say, I, I really love the fact that you describe the model as being anti-establishment, because I think that's exactly what it is. It, the, the model is about subverting the idea of a monolithic institution that is like at the top of the food chain of culture. We'd much rather be like networked into, like we basically can't do anything yeah. without collaboration. Like we, we can't, we, we have to collaborate and that's wonderful. Um, I think the whole of theater has changed because of COVID. Um, I, I um, more than even like the models I think for like national institutions being non-building based I think one of the things that that we are thinking about is co-creation like ab about the voices uh, like a democratization of who is making the art um, mm. But I also think we there is always going to be a place for sitting in a theater for like, I don't know, I go to bed, I go to sleep, like thinking about being in a theater, like, even though I don't have a theater, like I like the moment when, um, you know, you're sitting in one space and you know that there's people around you and you know you're going through a communal experience to think and feel because other people are in front of you in the real moment. Um, yeah. is like something I'm desperate for. So I think, yeah, it doesn't answer your question, but I think, I think not just, I think because of COVID all kind of um, assumptions on what status and power and formality, I think it's all gone. I think like suddenly 
like the values that are important are cooperation, co collaboration, flexibility, being able to be reactive are much more important than like being the best, um, which is really interesting. I think we've got another question from Apasana. Hi, um, so since all of us are here uh, as fellows creating tech art, so the, that's why it's related to that. So we don't really know the impact of this, I'd call it an exodus from the analog to the digital world that this entire lockdown has caused and upon us. And even a lot of us who were very averse to social media even have no option. That's the only space where we can real space now. It's almost a real space. So uh, that exodus is, is, I would call it a migration. So we've been talking about migrant workers, laborers. This is a migration of an entire species from the analog world to the digital world. So coming to that, uh, in the digital space, often ideas and su suggestions are made by art uh, way before it is actually articulated in the real world. So as artists and designers, especially right now, if you have any thoughts on the responsibility that we have to contribute uh, to this conversation, which is the radical, open, optimistic future that we are all hoping for, that's why we are here. Uh, can we co-create? Um, you know, these are, we have those Zoom interaction rules that we have before we interact, you know, mute yourself, et cetera. So could we have at least as creators, I think Dara is lovely to be one space where we could do that, maybe build a set of agreements there and expand it to everyone else, it would be really good uh, for this new planet we are embarking on. So any thoughts on that? I'm going to defer to my panelists. I think Jackie should answer that. <laughs> Oh, I don't, uh, oh, I feel like the group, sorry, but I do feel like the group here has got a, probably a better perspective on that as I'm like a 40 year old with two kids at home. <laughs> I feel like you guys have got, probably got much better answers than me. I'd be really, really fascinated to know, really, really fascinated to know how you co-create the digital future. If anybody can tell me how to do that, I would, like, that would be great. <laughs> well, one thing I will commit to doing is I'm with the with the fellows that are here. Uh, I would love to at least have a few sessions on it uh, in the weeks ahead. And in particular, like you know, how would you like? How could we imagine seeing something like Dara evolve within that? Uh, that would be a conversation I'd love to have. Um, oh. Lost you there, Sean. No, no, I, I was said. Um, <clears throat> so let me go, we'll do another one that's come up. Um, in the context of India, the huge population joining the internet range of diversity of culture, economics, languages, landscape, it's necessary that most people not knowing what their data and privacy rights are. And so um, I, I guess the question is, how can we better inform you know, the broader public around what are their data privacy rights? Uh, what have been effective ways to do that? And you know, what role can art play in that? Uh, let's go with Jackie, given, or sorry, let's go with Jaina, then this one's a little bit India focused. No, I mean, we can go uh, uh, with Jackie too, but I can just say that, I mean, you know, uh, there, this, is, this does remain a big challenge. How do we make people aware of um, our privacy rights? Uh, and that becomes even more difficult in a context like India because we don't have actual laws um, guaranteeing uh, data privacy. We just have kind of constitutional guarantees which are uh, stronger but kind of more difficult to uh, disseminate. So we need kind of conversations which bring these issues in our daily lives. You know, how do we bring these kind of fundamental rights conversations in our day-to-day uh, -day conversations uh, and therefore create awareness? And, you know, one of the conversations one of the things that came up in court, interestingly, in the right to privacy case was that, you know, the government argued that, oh, there's no problem if privacy and information is shared. Uh, the poor don't care for their privacy, you know. Um, so that was that was the argument that uh, for some people, uh, data privacy is not important. Uh, but I don't think, uh, I mean, um, I, uh, I, I don't think it's the case uh, at all. 
And so how do we kind of uh, create more awareness on uh, some of these issues? Um, and maybe Dara could uh, take some of that into its uh, projects with the fellows. That would be a good way to start, I think. Yeah, and I think the other thing that we have to keep keenly aware of is we have to root our legal arguments deeply in like the case law and the constitutional you know, support structures that already exist, um, lest you know, the country comes and decides that, okay, you can't download that app from the app store. And so you know, the government always has tools right, to prevent access if it wishes. And so I feel like as we think about this, the legal basis for our reasoning and why we need to exist needs to be quite sound as well. And so anyways, um, another question from Barca. Uh, yeah, mainly like uh, you answered, but I have another question which I wanted to ask uh, Jaina, like the, as you also mentioned, like these days we see a lot of uh, people making artworks for the issues around and then it becomes viral and which is a very positive note, like how social media helps, uh, you know, connecting communities with the real message. Uh, like now the question is that uh, does this formally add value to uh, the frameworks like law policy policy or does this help formally when uh, in some sense? Um, I didn't get your question too clearly if you could explain. Uh, maybe it's it's like uh, there, is, there are a lot of people who engage on dialogues, which which artworks on social media, uh, does this really help fighting about the issues on ground to uh, or in courts? Um, yeah, I think it does because, um, you know, we always find that when an issue goes to court, uh, it's not just always the courtroom uh, battle that kind of, uh, uh, you know, helps win the case. I think in la larger public interest cases uh, or larger public interest issues, uh, the social movement uh, on the ground helps, uh, you know, uh, helps in the uh, outcome of the case. And often if um, it could be activism on the ground, it could be, it could be arts related activism, it could be online activism, which helps build uh, strong public opinions on certain uh, issues and definitely it uh, helps causes very, very strongly. Thank you. Uh, Marcel, we've got another question. Yeah, um, I was actually wondering that like, um, if you guys had any idea of uh, what kind of tools, uh, tools that we would be able to use that we should like look into it, um, especially looking at like the government censoring certain things or us not being able to access the same technology as let's say government or states or big companies um do you have like any tips uh, or ideas around like that i'll i have one quick answer on this and um one of the things that really opened my eyes is there is an arms race of technology providers creating surveillance technology that then sell to every surveillance organization around the world, right? And so one of the ones that <clears throat> I met a guy, this is like eight years ago before Snowden, and he said, I, he was an investor in a group called I2, and they aggregated public data networks and private data networks, which were social and geographical. And that was like so vague that it sounded like nothing. But basically the example that it gave is like, yeah, let's take all the credit card data that you know all of your credit card companies have. And we're gonna merge that with all of the camera data from license plate readers and all of the passport and visa entries that are happening to make, create one social graph to basically allow surveillance and, and, and operatives. And then, they, and then I looked them up and what's really interesting, and this is where I think there's a lot of fodder for artists, is they have marketing sites, right? If you go in and you know to an American or Belgian company and say, hey, I'm interested in buying your latest product, they will give you a demo, right? And the demo of these tools that basically surveillance operators use literally to target which 
drones should target which people operating in Central Asia. Like that's literally what they sold. And, and so that was tremendously interesting to me. And I think there's incredible fodder for there to basically research what are the tools, what are the, what are the modern weapon systems that are being sold on top of these digital systems? And then you just go ask them and you, know, you can pretend to be a prospective buyer um, and get them to give you a product demo. And, and then suddenly your eyes will be amazed at kind of what power and technology they've got. And so this is the sort of you know, ways that we can leverage this sort of global capitalist supply chain that we've got to, to make interesting art and pull forth you know, interesting insights. Sites. I'm happy to answer all questions on that or to, to defer to my panels too, but that was one way that I did it and I really liked it. Uh, okay. Um, so, and then one question for Jaina that's come in, uh, you know, how can we use or replicate things like GDPR? Uh, you know, they're a really a great platform inside of, of Europe to basically enhance data privacy rights. Um, you know, how can we, you know, push that all over? How can we, you know, make that story more aware? Uh, I would love to hear an answer to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have a data privacy uh, law in India. There is a bill that is uh, floating around and uh, being debated, but um, we can't say when that will uh, be passed. But I think what we can do at least uh, while we're waiting for a law is that uh, at least in the platforms and um, spaces that we are engaged in, we can have, uh, you know, data privacy, um, you know, terms or agreements, simple agreements uh, kind of put in place so that, and we can ensure that, uh, you know, the data is protected and the person has that privately in some of these spaces by making simple agreements or terms uh, and also make people more aware of um, say that uh, my data can't be used without my permission you know often people don't even know that they have a right to do that um, so creating more awareness I guess is more important um, I'm just a little bit aware of the time uh, at this point, you know, Jackie or Jaina, if you've got any sort of final comments, uh, I'd love to hear those and then we'll pass off to Kambia. So Jackie. Yeah, I don't want this to sound in any way like condescending or anything like that, but, but I am just like so um, amazed by the sort of level of thought that is like that is going on um around like social change and digital and um like activism and rights and um it's just been really inspiring to um have a moment amongst like the covid kind of working from home like trying to kind of solve these like theater art form challenges to be in the company of like uh, a group of people who are clearly asking those really difficult and intense questions and even if there isn't like the answers it feels um really uh optimistic to be in the company of people who are trying to figure out what the right path might be rather than carrying on a, a, as we are it sounds so simplistic my brain my brain has been um fried by COVID. <laughs> um, you are not alone. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. And then Jaina, any final thoughts? I think it's, um, you know, just hearing from uh, some of the fellows and some of the questions is just so exciting that many teams are being by uh, we have such a close kind of interaction with the law, like what Paul asked about, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, tampering with evidence, digital evidence, and all of that, and art projects around it. But, and I just feel that, you know, lawyers need to, need to see more of these artists. We are too, in, you know, isolated in the law world, and it can be quite dry. And I think lawyers, judges, prosecutors need to see the real, need to see these exciting worlds where uh, artists are asking these questions and raising these issues. So I think 
Um, it's also a time for more collaboration with of artists and lawyers. And I think Dara should find a way to do that. <laughs> and theater uh, persons as well. And that's why I think, you know, um, we should find a way to do that. Yeah, and I feel like this is a good segue. In many ways, Dara is just a technology platform, but, you know, be fantastic as an organization yeah. Yeah. is that bigger piece that's trying to pull together these different threads and to really showcase, you know, work that's happening in the public. And so with that, come in. I need a breath before I start talking, folks. Uh, but thank you. Thanks to all of you panel members for having pulled in such a thrilling session. Jenna, examples from your legal world were just amazing to feel. So just as much as you wish you contend with the artists in the world who are doing this, I think we've had a fabulous time looking into your world. And yes, we must meet more. <laughs> Jackie, thanks so much for your time, um, taking us through how, a, how, how an art form like theater could even be thought of digitally, like, wow, right? So kudos to you as you think through all of that. And um, thank you for sharing some of the pains and pleasures of doing that in your world. Uh, and I really thank Sean for pulling together these seemingly diverse worlds, like, legality and art in the tech art world coming together is as crazy as tech and art coming together. So thank you, Sean, for pulling it together so seamlessly. And um, we are in a momentous time. There's something going on in the world around uh, with this room of critical thinkers. I really think the needle is shifting. Uh, a lot of the points that all of you brought up today saying, we need to regulate, we need agreements. I love that word, Dupasna, agreements, right? Some of us are scared of regulation. We're not sure about rules and regulations and more control, but I think putting that forth as agreements makes a world of difference. And as we step into this new world, agreements uh, become really important. And maybe that's something for us to do within this colla uh, collaborative fellowship. And, um, we have to thank our funders, Goethe Institute and uh, British Council, who have really enabled the space of coming together and enabling the magic that happens here. So a big thanks to their support and uh, all of you for your absolutely hearty time. It's been 90 minutes and a thrilling 90 minutes. So let's keep this energy going over the next uh, week that we have left and for all of you who are listening, their attendees, thank you for your time. Keep tuned into befantastic.in for more of the magic that all these fabulous people here are going to create. So with that, um, we will say good night, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and good luck. Thank you.